are back, let's take our Bibles, please, and open to Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14 as we study through Luke. Luke 11, 14, the title of our message this morning is The Strong Man in Our Lives. The Lord is going to show us a very important insight in regards to who He is in our lives now. And so let's look to His Word and just pray as we receive a blessing from Him this morning. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You because we know that You send it with Your heart. You send it with a desire to transform our lives. And so, Lord, as You move upon our hearts by Your Holy Spirit, Lord, train, change us, transform us by Your Word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we pick it up in Luke 11. Jesus is on His way towards Jerusalem. He's headed south from the Sea of Galilee area. And uh, as he's traveling from village to village and area to area, the crowds are beginning to increase. And uh, <clears throat> it also appears obvious that a delegation has been sent from the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. And the idea is not only to, to keep an eye on him, but also to interfere with what he is doing. And here's why. By this time, Jesus had already become famous. And the Jewish leaders were very threatened by him. And in fact, you're going to see in this chapter that they begin to confront him publicly. And the idea here is to try to draw the crowds away, to try to sway the crowds because they are amazed at him, following after him. They want to drive a wedge if they can. Now, what happened is that the, the confrontation between the Jewish leaders and Jesus is going to grow in intensity as he gets nearer and nearer, not only into Jerusalem, but also culminating into his arrest and to his crucifixion. All of this, of course, is very important, and we're going to see it as we go through the story. Now, in this section here, what was happening is that Jesus was casting out a demon. And the, the crowds were just marveling at the power of God moving in this man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And when the crowds were marveling, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, decided to interject themselves into the story. <clears throat> and see, what they decided to do in order to sway the crowds away from Jesus, when Jesus cast out the demon, the crowds are marveling, they jumped in and they said, now look, he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Now this is a shocking statement, and here's why. Beelzebul uh, is literally translated Lord of the Flies. And it is a name that is associated with Satan himself. In other words, they just accused Jesus of casting out a demon by the power of Satan. Now, when you stand back and realize it, this is, this is nothing short of an audacious, bold, and, and, and very, very tragic accusation. And here's why. They knew full well that Jesus was moving by the power of God. They knew full well. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because in John 3, there was a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night, and he wanted to have a private and honest conversation with Jesus. And part of that conversation is where uh, uh, Nicodemus said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know, this is the insight here, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, because no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. In other words, they knew full well that Jesus had been sent by God and moved in God's power. When he was casting out a demon, they knew it was God's power. When he was healing the sick, they knew it was God's power. But they had the unmitigated gall to suggest that he was moving by the power of Satan. This is important for us to understand. The other Jewish leaders jumped in also and began testing him by demanding of him a sign from heaven. Prove who you are. Do some kind of sign. Prove who you are. They were asking him to, to do a miracle, yes, but they were more than that looking for a way of being in command. That they would direct him to follow from their leading. Jesus is going to respond to both of these questions. And his response is filled with power, it's filled with wisdom, it's filled with insight. And it is for us as well as it is for them. So we would do well to hear it and to apply it. Luke 11, verse 14. 
And he was casting out a demon, and it was dumb. And it came about that when the demon had gone out, that the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled at this. But some of them, and we know from another gospel that they're Pharisees, they interjected and they said, He cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Now others, testing him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Now he knew their thoughts, and he said, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? For you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, this is a very powerful statement. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then indeed the kingdom of God has come upon you. Then he is going to introduce a principle by which he demonstrates how then a demon is cast out. But it becomes a principle for our lives as well because it's called the principle of the strong man. And I want to look at this because it is a principle of faith. In other words we see that faith is strengthened by this principle. In other words, let's look at it this way. Have faith. Jesus is our strong man. In other words, increase in faith because Jesus is our strong man, which is what we're going to see. Jesus' first response to their accusation was essentially, that doesn't make sense. Uh, he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Jesus responds, that doesn't make any sense at all. Because uh, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. He then explains the principle of the strong man. We want to understand that. But first, I want to look at their hearts for a minute. I want to look at the hearts of the Pharisees. What on the earth is happening here? What bitter words, what bitter, harsh words come out of their mouths here? Why? And one of the things we need to understand is what is going on in their hearts. Because we all know this principle, our words reveal our hearts. Is this not true? Now, we all say a lot of words. We really need to understand that principle. Jesus said the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Jesus said that immediately after calling them a brood of vipers, which is a very strong word to say about them. A den of snakes, poisonous, biting. Why? Because they knew, they knew that Jesus was doing miracles and casting out demons by the power of God. They knew then that what they were saying was absolutely false. Why would they say this? It's all about the heart. The heart was hard and bitterness resulted. In Matthew 12, verses 34 to 35, we have a great word from Jesus. He says, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. Now there's a great great encouragement. Don't you want that to be said of you? The good man, out of his good treasure, says what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what's evil. That's interesting. I remember <clears throat> someone telling me one time, trying to, uh, uh, trying to explain his rude behavior and his very offensive tongue, said uh, to me, look, this is just the way I am, okay? And by this, he's explaining himself. He's trying to excuse his rude and offensive behavior by saying, look, this is just who I am, okay? This is supposed to excuse it, you see. Actually, we might say, well, that is who you were and now are. The bigger question is, who are you becoming? Because we're all becoming something. We're all in the state of becoming or changing. You see, they were under the false impression. Whoever says, look, this is just who I am, is under the false assumption that who they are is somehow locked into some genetic code and that they have no choice but to live out the disposition given to them. Now, that actually is true of alligators, crocodiles, and hyenas. It is not true of us. We know that we can be transformed, and in fact, we know this because not only did God say it, I've seen it. I have seen the hard 
softened. I have seen the bitter healed. I have seen the God of heaven transform many lives. And he wants to do it even now, even with you. It's important for us to understand it. Now, let's go back to Luke 11 and look at this principle that he's teaching about the strong man. I'd like to perhaps phrase it this way. The Lion of Judah is for you. Now, the reason I like that is that the scripture in many places describes Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, a lion is a power, you know, is a declaration of power and strength. And we understand that that perspective is tremendous when we understand that it applies to Jesus in our lives. Look at the principle of the strong man and we'll see what we mean. Verse 20. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Here it is now. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own homestead, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. Okay. Jesus is explaining here the principle by which a demon is cast out. Let's look at it. Look at the demon-possessed man and understand that when that man was demon-possessed, the strong man in his life was Satan. Satan was the strong man, and therefore the demon was possessing this man. So Jesus then comes and overpowers the strong man. He binds Satan. And by binding Satan, then he can bring the, the demon out and heal the man. He gives us a great explanation there. Now, we all understand the principle. Uh, it applies to our lives as well. We can see it in our own experience. For example, imagine husband and wife asleep. Houses all locked up, buttoned up, windows locked, everything is secure. Middle of the night, they hear a crash downstairs. That's when the strong man of the house takes action. He wakes up, he nudges his wife in the ribs, and he says, Honey, you need to go downstairs and see what's happening downstairs. No, of course not. That's not what's going to happen. The strong man is going to take action, he's going to get up, and he's going to deal with whatever is going on downstairs. That's the, the principle of the strong man. Although, right now, in our house, uh, our son is home from the Marines. And he is in special forces. So if something should happen in the middle of the night, we send our son. Go deal with whatever's happening down there. But you, anyway, you see the principle of the strong man. Now, here's how it applies to our lives. When someone asks Jesus into their heart as Lord and Savior, the scriptures tell us that he takes up residence in their lives. He then dwells in the midst of them. Remember the scripture in Revelation 3? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, I will sup with him, and he with me. He's describing that relationship by entering into the life. In other words, Jesus takes up residence with us. Now, if Jesus is taking up residence in our house, frankly, he's the strong man. And the question then is, who would overcome him? Because that's the principle. So if Jesus is taking up residence in the house, then the strong man is indeed Jesus, the strong man of heaven for us. Now this is a very important principle which helps us to understand why a believer cannot be possessed by a demon. Now this is important because there is some debate and dispute in the, in the Christian community as to whether a, a Christian can be possessed by a demon. I say forthrightly and strongly it cannot be so. To which someone would say, well, can you demonstrate that from Scripture? I just did. It's right there in the principle of the strong man. If Jesus is taking up residence within us, and then a demon comes to possess that person whom he has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that demon is going to have to overcome Jesus in order to possess that believer. And that uh, demon has no possibility of overcoming Jesus. And so therefore, that strong man is our strong man of heaven, is taking up residence in our lives. And frankly, that should ignite our faith. When we understand that that strong man is now also for us. Do you believe that God is for you? 
See, this is a very important principle. Many people somehow believe that God is angry with them. God is always angry with them. That is not what I see in the scriptures. What I see is that God loves and that God is for you and that when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, the strong man of heaven takes up residence in your life and is for you. Look at this scripture. 1 John 4, verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, overcome the world. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. There's a strength of principle there. Romans 8, verses 31, and then we look at 33 and 34. What shall we say to these things? I love that question. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Isn't that a great verse? If God is for us, is God for you? Do you believe that God is for you? Yes, he's for you. And if God is for you, then who could be against you? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It says, look, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? If God justifies you, there is no one who can condemn you. Amen? This is important to understand because then we see that faith is ignited by this principle. Notice what Jesus says next in verse 23. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. What does this mean? It means that there is no neutral ground. Some people don't like that statement, there is no neutral ground, because it doesn't sound very politically correct. We live in a day and an age where the mantra of the world seems to be, hey, now let's just love each other and get along and let's be all inclusive. The problem is that's not the way it is in reality. Let me give you an illustration. If you're sailing on the Titanic and the ship hits an iceberg, I submit to you that there is no neutral ground. If you're, if you're sailing on the Titanic and the ship hits an iceberg, either you get in the lifeboat or you're going down. There are only two options here. And so this is the principle that we need to understand. But we see it very clearly when we understand that the Titanic is a great illustration of the world. There are only two options here. The good news is that God is doing something about it. God loves the world so much. Do you believe that God loves the world? God loves the world so much, the scripture says, that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. There are only two options in the verse. Whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now, some try to take a neutral stance and say, well, you know, Jesus was, he was a good man. Or he was uh, perhaps an ascended guru, or maybe Jesus was a teacher of good. The problem is Jesus is the one who's teaching here that there is no neutral ground. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And in fact, we were just looking at this. A quote from C.S. Lewis. Jesus is either a liar, or he's a lunatic, or is he Lord as he claimed? There are only those choices. And it's important for us to understand because the impact is profound. Let me show you what I mean. Go to the next verse. He gives a very important follow-on principle beginning in verse 24. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first state of that man. What does this mean? It's a very profound, important understanding. Because Jesus is helping us to understand that the principle then of, of cleansing that man of those demons is so that the heart can be filled to the fullness of God. That's the purpose. And if that does not happen, then it does not help the man. This is important to understand for us because you look at, for example, the, the, the principle when you see the, the Jewish Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. They didn't deserve, excuse me, they didn't desire true personal revival. They didn't desire transformation of the heart. Their hearts were empty, and therefore it left the door open for every evil desire to creep in and to find a home. 
It must be filled. True transformation has two parts. This is important to say. True transformation has two parts. The first part is saying, I want no more of the world. I understand that the worldly things are going to destroy my life. I know that they are death to me. I want no more of them. Well, that's only part of transformation. The other part of transformation is saying, and now I need, oh God, the fullness of God in my life. I want to be filled up to the full with the presence of God in my life. That is important to see as well. Maybe an illustration might be food. We all relate to food. If we can say junk food is a picture of worldly things, because we understand it. You know, you eat junk food. It's very bad for you. You'll die. And so it's a picture. If somebody says, you know, I understand now that I, I want to avoid junk food. If that's all you've been eating, and then you say, I'm going to avoid junk food, well, you're going to die because you're not eating anything. The point is, if you're going to say, I know I've got to stop eating junk food, what you're also then saying, therefore, I am now going to take in what is good. In other words, it's not enough to say, you're right, God, I need to sweep out my life. That's not enough. You can say, oh, you're right, God, I need to sweep out my life. No, you need to also say, oh, God, fill me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the fullness of life in my heart. See, without the filling of the Holy Spirit, there's no spiritual power for victory. Without the, without the joy of the Lord, there's no strength in the heart. Oh, Lord, fill me as well. Notice what comes next, because the, the next response is found in verse 29. But before we look at verse 29, there's almost a side note in the two verses before it. Now, what's interesting is that somebody calls out, a woman calls out something from the crowd. You might almost call her a heckler, except it's not, it, it's positive. And it came about, verse 27, that uh, while he said these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts in which you nursed, or at which you nursed. Now, this would have been a perfect opportunity for Jesus to elevate Mary, but, she do but he doesn't. Notice what he says in response. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and do something about it. They respond to it. Then he goes on in verse 29. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. Remember that some of the Jewish leaders said, we demand of you a sign of heaven. Prove who you are. So he says, a wicked generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. So that is the sign that God is giving, the sign of Jonah. What does this mean? It's important to understand that it applies to us. Maybe the question for us is, what will you do with the sign of Jonah? It's a response thing. What will you do with the sign of Jonah? No sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now before we look at it, perhaps we should understand what is a sign and how is it used. A sign, this is important to understand, a sign is for those who lack faith. First, great principle, a sign is for those who lack faith. What is a sign? Well, a sign is some kind of miracle, some kind of indication that indeed it confirms what God was saying. This is important to understand, for there are people today who are seeking some kind of sign from God. They, they, they seek for a sign for God to direct their lives. God, show me a sign if I should do this or that. But that's kind of like seeking God for an omen. God doesn't do that either. In the Old Testament, God uses signs to strengthen faith. Let me give you an example. Maybe you remember the story of Moses. When God called Moses to deliver the people of Israel out of the slavery of Egypt, when he was calling Moses, Moses responded and he said, well, what if they will not believe me? Or what if they say, the Lord has not appeared to you? God then gave Moses the signs to bear witness that God had indeed spoken. This is actually in uh, Exodus 4, uh, verse 8. 
God is speaking and he says to Moses, if they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it out. It shall become blood. And then you know, so you remember the story, sign upon sign upon sign. As God demonstrated the greatness of his name at Egypt, all of the plagues that followed were those indications of God's word. Now, if you go back to Luke 11, and you realize here that the Pharisees were not honest in requesting a sign. What do you mean they weren't honest? Well, you see, the suggestion is, if you would give us a strong enough proof, then we will believe. See, there's, there's the thing to understand. If, if you would give us a strong enough proof, then, we'll, we, then we will believe. But they weren't looking for a reason to believe. Frankly, they were looking for a reason not to believe. They were looking for a reason to accuse. The problem is, when you look at it, Jesus had already given them so many evidences Powerful, powerful witnesses and proofs of who he is. This is the same Jesus who healed the blind. The lame were leaping for joy. The demons were cast out. Even a legion of demons were cast out. The, the, the mute can speak. The deaf could hear. The blind could see. All of these things God had already be do, been doing. But instead of receiving and responding, they accused him of being the devil. Here's also the problem. They were demanding a sign of their choosing and they reject the signs of God's choosing. Do people do this today, by the way? I suggest that people do. There are some people who come up with their own tests, the tests of their choosing, to demand God to prove who he is. For example, some people say, God, if you're real, then do such and such a thing. Aren't they doing the same thing that the Pharisees did? God, if you're real, then give me the winning lottery numbers and then I'll believe. God, if you're real, then heal me of this sickness and then I'll believe. God, if you're real, then get me out of this mess and then I'll believe. Many people even today are looking for some kind of sign. God, prove. Can I show you what, really, what real faith looks like? In Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, we have a picture of authentic, mature, genuine faith. Notice what it reads. The prophet writes, Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet still I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. In the God of my salvation, for the Lord God is my strength. He makes my feet like hinds feet. He lifts me up on higher places. This is an amazing statement of real, authentic faith. But going back to Luke 11, Jesus said, when they demanded a sign, no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. In other words, the greatest sign ever is the sign of Jonah. So what is the sign of Jonah? Well, you might remember the story. Jonah was commissioned by God as a prophet to go to the Assyrian people and especially the city of Nineveh and bring a message of repentance. You go. Out of God's compassion, out of God's mercy, he wanted Jonah to go to the Assyrian people in Nineveh and give them a message. You have an opportunity to repent and you should take it. The thing is, Jonah despised the Assyrian people. He despised them because the Assyrians had been so harsh and oppressive to Israel. He despised them. He couldn't imagine the thought of them repenting before God. And he didn't want to go. In fact, he went the opposite direction. He went down to this little city of Joppa, down on the coast. In fact, when we go to Israel, we're going to go to this same little town, and there's this little port there. And he got onto the ship, and he starts going in the opposite direction. Well, as he is going, then a great uh, a storm arises on the sea, and, and then it is revealed that, that Jonah, prophet of God, is running, and so running from God. Therefore, he's cast into the sea in the middle of the ocean. You know the story. He's taken by a great sea creature, and then three days later, therefore, he's essentially brought to his commission into this uh, a belly of this, of this great animal and brought right to the shores of Nineveh. But he was in there for these three days. Now, the whole point is this. 
that all of that is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As Jonah was three days, Jesus is three days in the earth. It tells us this is a sign of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Very important for us to understand. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the evidence. It is the proof to the world that God is indeed the resurrection and the life. You say, well, God, do something. Demonstrate the greatness of your power. He did. He raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 17 and 20, if God has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The question is, what will you do in response to what God is doing? God demonstrates the power of who He is. God demonstrates His love. What will we do in response? Because, this is what Jesus says, something greater than Jonah is here. Notice what he says. Go back to Luke 11, verse 30. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. See, the sign of Jonah, that was a sign to the Ninevites. And then he gives these two examples. Verse 31. The Queen of the South, you might recognize her in the Scriptures as the Queen of Sheba. Sheba meaning seven. Perhaps she's the uh, queen of seven realms or seven countries or, or something. And it tells us that the queen of the south shall rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Here's the point. This woman, a leader of, uh, of seven nations or seven kingdoms or something, she heard that God had given wisdom to Solomon. Here's the point. She did something about it. She heard, God has spoken wisdom to a man. God has spoken wisdom to Solomon. When she heard that, she decided she needed to do something about it. She got up. She traveled a great distance. She sat. She humbled herself. She received the word of wisdom that God had given to Solomon. That's the point. She did something about it. He gives another example, verse 32. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Here's the point. When Jonah appeared in Nineveh, he gave them then the message of repentance. They did something about it. They repented before God. The question then for us is, what will we do about it? In other words, God has demonstrated His power. God has demonstrated His love. Now, what will we do about it? What we should do is to respond by opening our heart. If God is pouring out His love, we should respond by opening our heart to receive it. If God is pouring out His life, we should be responding by opening our hearts to receive it. That is the right response. We should thank God for all that he's done for us. We should respond with all of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for you because you have demonstrated the greatness of your love. You've demonstrated to us the power of who you are. You've loved us so amazingly. What should we do about it? Well, Lord, we, this morning, we respond to you. That's what we want to do about it. We want to respond to you. If you're pouring out your love, then we open our heart to receive it. If you're pouring out your life, then we open our heart to receive it. Church, this morning, isn't it an opportunity to respond? What has God done for you? When you stand back and realize it, it's amazing. How should you respond to that? He loved you so much. He sent His only Son to take the penalty of your sin on the cross. How should you respond to that? He loved you so much that He forgave all of the sins of your life by paying the penalty for every last one. 
How should you respond to that? He's demonstrated who he is so that you can see convincingly. How should you respond to that? I suggest that we respond by giving him our heart, by giving him our love, by giving him our thanks, by saying, God, I want to honor you in my life. I want to worship you with my choices and life and decisions I make, and I want to honor you with how I live this life you've given me. Is that your heart? Would you even say that to the Lord today? God, this is my heart right there. Lord, I want to respond by loving you. I want to respond by honoring you. I want to respond by living for you. Is that your heart? Would you just raise your hand and even say that to the Lord? God, I'm responding because of what you've done for me. The queen of the south, she did something about it. The Nineveh, they did something. It's our chance. Lord, we're doing something. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We're doing something. We want to live. We want to love. Pour your fullness of your life into us, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, can we give...